Demon hunters, warring gods, and forgotten worlds await with TNM Comics. Click the links below to enter their fantastical realm. <sighs> well, I've avoided it for a long time, but I suppose there's no escaping it any longer. Still, I'll be even more damned if I'm going in without fortification. Bailiff, prepare the emergency protocols. Uh, better make it the dire emergency protocols. Yes, that ought to do it. All right, let's get straight to the point and get this over with. Our next offender, Beauty and the Beast, The Enchanted Christmas. Look, as much as I love Beauty and the Beast, I will admit my fandom leans more toward the indulgent than the protective. I mean, I actually enjoyed the live-action remake. It had its flaws. No, Emma Watson refusing to wear a corset is not taking a bold stand against the patriarchy. Read a book on historical costuming sometime. But what it did get right, it did well enough to make it worthwhile, if not exactly the equal of its source. But even I have my limits. For example, I will never forgive this. Make it sing, sing, sing. Make it dance, dance, dance. After all, miss, this is friends. And I will never forgive this 1997 follow-up that was among the earliest of Disney's direct-to-video sequels. It was originally intended to be a true sequel, with an antagonist in the form of Gaston's previously unheard-of brother Avnol. Nice nod to Cocteau there. But the writers soon realized that it was kind of hard to have a sequel to Beauty and the Beast when the Beast, well, wasn't one. So they wrote this fill-in fic for the original movie and dressed it up in some holiday tinsel, making it a crappy direct-to-video sequel and a crappy holiday special wrapped up in one special gift pack. <sighs> it's enough to make you believe in Krampus again. But I'm just stalling. Let's examine the case of Beauty and the Beast, The Enchanted Christmas. And already the movie is making me wish I was watching the original instead. We don't like what we don't understand. In fact, it scares us, and this monster is mysterious at least. Everything in the unenchanted castle is in full holiday gear, including ornaments commemorating the time when the entire staff was transformed into housewares because their boss pissed off one of the fair folk. Not sure that's an event you want to memorialize. Anyway, the household starts reminiscing about last year's Christmas, which was rather more eventful. Well, I suppose I, I did manage to save Christmas. You? Yes, me. <laughs> if not for my skillful and decisive leadership, all would have been lost. Leadership? Ha! You could this first leader. scene just highlights how inferior the animation is compared to the original. And yes, I know it's direct-to-video and we have to lower our expectations, but it irritates me how bland and off-model all the characters look. You know that fresco in Spain that some moron tried to paint over and really made a mess of the whole thing? That's this movie, a sad imitation of something that was originally a masterpiece. Chip asks his mother to tell the story of last Christmas even though he was, you know, there for most of it, and Mrs. Potts leads us into the narrative proper, which apparently takes place shortly after the wolf incident in the first movie. The enchanted objects are in full matchmaking mode now, trying in their not-so-subtle way to set their boss up with Belle on an ice skating date. Come on, why don't you try it like this? One, two, three, one, two, three. <laughs> See, it's easy. Easy for you to say, Belle, you don't have size 15 paws. However, there is one castle resident who isn't keen on seeing this romance develop. That would be Forte, the court composer turned huge-ass CGI pipe organ. Before the enchantment, there was no need for my particular brand of genius. But now the master needs my melodies to feed his tormented soul. Ah, uh, Tim Curry. We all love Tim Curry, right? I think it's because he always goes all out in everything he does. Even with bad material to work with, and let's face it, he's had lots and lots of that, he devotes all his energy to the part and manages to wring something out of it worth watching. And such is the case here. He actually has some very effective moments as the Beast Siago. Oh, there's a big surprise! Please pretend you have a smattering of education. He owed me well. The better shall my purpose 
work on him. Thank you. So he's a decent bad guy, and it's obvious 99% of this movie's budget went into animating his character. Trust me, for 1997, this stuff was cutting edge. And yet, it pains me to admit that I cannot give Tim Curry a saving grace in this movie. Why? Because of a helium-voiced millstone named Fife. Bravo! Bravo! Meet Fife, Enchanted Piccolo, and Forte's official LeFou. He's a henchman of the hearts not really in it will defect to the good guys at the first opportunity variety, and he's a shrill little nuisance. But what makes him truly terrible, and what causes him to drag Tim Curry down with him, is that his presence highlights Forte's fundamental handicap as a villain. I'm bolted to the wall! Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, Forte is functionally immobile, so he has to send Fife out to do his dirty work for him. It's really difficult to be an intimidating villain when you're relying on your dopey lackey to get anything done. Pay attention. I need you to pace when I think. See? How can you be an effective bad guy if you have to outsource pacing? Fife's motivation for doing so is also rather weak. He's bucking for a solo in Forte's next big composition. Yeah, but, uh, Maestro, she's so nice. When you're finished fawning, Fife, perhaps you can recommend someone else to play your solo? Seriously, what are his other options? It's either the piccolo or the violin playing coat rack. At Forte's instigation, Fife spoils the pseudo-romantic moment between Belle and the Beast, mostly through sheer incompetence. Belle doesn't seem to mind and instantly starts making snow angels. This is no angel. It's the shadow of a... Monster. Well, that escalated quickly. I don't know why I'd bother. Now he's worse than ever. Okay, movie, stop right there and answer to sin number three. What the here did you do to Bell? The main thing that separates Beauty and the Beast from the domestic abuse enabler Stockholm Syndrome story it's often mislabeled as is the fact that Belle never makes it her mission to improve the Beast. She is not his manic pixie dream girl. If anything, she's his Elizabeth Bennet, the person who refuses to put up with his crap and who forces him to acknowledge that he needs to improve himself in order to be worthy of the love he seeks. Turning her into this sap who wastes all of her energy trying to cheer up her gloomy captor is obviously an insult to the strength of her character, but it also throws the beast under the bus too, because it denies him the self-knowledge and development it took to become a better person, figuratively speaking. To really add insult to injury, Belle has an entire song about how she just wants to know the beast better and make him happy and basically be a supporting character in his story. When I get to know him, we'll find more things to say. One day I will reach him, there has to be a way. So while the Beast goes to sulk and listen to moody pipe organ music, is there any other kind? Belle reminds the staff that the holidays are upon them. Belle? What's Christmas? Okay, I know the timeline on this enchantment is a bit fuzzy, but I refuse to believe Chip's been a teacup for so long that he's never heard of Christmas. Thing is, the Beast has put a veto on holiday festivities, which Cogsworth, in his role of official Killjoy, points out. It's not fair! Don't whine, glasses. I'm just going to pretend I'm deaf and didn't have to hear that joke. But even Cogsworth can't resist the temptation of a good Christmas dinner, and Lumiere just happens to know someone who can get the castle spruced up. Angelique, castle decorator turned Christmas tree topper, and ironic pessimist about the whole Christmas thing. Ha! Christmas? I refuse to hop for it anymore. I will not be disappointed again. And so Belle launches into her true meaning of Christmas in a generic secular sense song. You know, all about hope and joy and fam... Uh, uh, can we address the fact that Belle seems to be forgetting a very important person right now? Papa. 
Characters get dropped by the wayside in sequels all the time, but it really, really bugs me here because this story is taking place inside a narrative where the relationship between Belle and her father is the primary catalyst. It's Belle's love for him that causes her to accept imprisonment in his stead, it's Maurice's love for her that impels him to launch a rescue attempt, and finally it's the Beast's recognition and understanding of that bond that inspires him to put Belle's needs above his own in his first act of real love. The very least this movie could do is acknowledge, even in passing, that Belle would be thinking about her father at Christmas. Also, this just makes the timeline of the original film more confusing. Was Maurice wandering around lost in the woods until Twelfth Night? So after that sub be our guest sequence, the Beast gets word via Forte via Fife about the festivities in the offing, and he's pouty about it. Partially because Forte insinuates Belle's doing this to spite him, but mostly because he's got some painful memories associated with the season. Who disturbs my Christmas? Yep, it turns out the Enchantress showed up on Christmas Day because both she and this film have the subtlety of a cannon of red and green glitter to the face. I am digging Forte's human look, though, sort of like Mock filtered through Dan Stevens' fabulous party get-up. Speaking of, say what you will about the live-action movie, at least it did the prologue about a thousand times better than what we've got here. The Beast storms in on Belle as she's searching for a Yule log in the boiler. Okay, that's terrifying right there. Okay, yes, the whole deal is that the castle furnishings are transfigured staff members, but it comes off as a lot creepier in this movie than it does in the original. I think that's because the animators in the original film knew how far to take the anthropomorphization. Characters that do have faces and appendages have them in ways that fit with their overall construction, but other objects are humanized less when doing so would upset the overall structure. Just about everything in Enchanted Christmas's castle has a big cartoon face slapped on it, which is unsettling. How does Belle even manage to stay sane with all these things looking at her all the time? Particularly annoying, so much so that it earns sin number six, is an axe which speaks with a gratuitous Yiddish accent under the mistaken assumption that gratuitous Yiddish accents are inherently funny. I'm sorry. I'll get a saw. No, that's fine. I don't want I should put you out. So the beast storms in and is all, You can't have Christmas because my man pain! And Belle is all, It's your own fault for being such a grump! And for a moment it looks like she might have some semblance of her original character back. Nope, she's ready to give up after being yelled at for ten seconds. But the disappointment on Chip's face is enough to convince her to go, Screw him, we're doing Christmas anyway! And she leaves Beast's present in the West Wing while she and Chip go hunting for a tree. What about this one? Oh, never reference a good Christmas special in your terrible Christmas special. Meanwhile, the Beast finds Belle's gift and realizes he doesn't have anything to give to her, and that library thing is probably going to be difficult to top. He asks Forte to compose a song for Belle, and Forte realizes the time has come for desperate measures. So he lures Belle to... Okay, he has Fife Dog Whistle the footstool to him so Belle can follow. Yeah, that lessens the sinister quality significantly. While they talk, Belle admits they're having trouble finding a decent Christmas tree in the castle environs. But did you look in the Black Forest? There you will find a tree better than any you could dream of. I promised your master I wouldn't leave the castle grounds. Also, a pack of hungry wolves nearly killed her, so there's that. It looks dangerous. That's because wolves, Belle! Sweet Lucifer, it wasn't even that long ago! You are in more danger in this very room. I assure you. Oh, dear Lord of Darkness, why don't you just hang a sign on your pipes that says, Evil Counselor, do not trust under any circumstances? And Belle, you were supposed to be the smart Disney princess. What the here happened? 
How does the woman who saw right through Gaston inside of 30 seconds get taken in by the obviously malevolent Tim Curry-voiced organ? Fortunately, the wolves seem to be off the clock for the holiday and content themselves with growling at Belle from the sidelines as she and Chip go tree shopping. But the beast sees her leaving via the magic mirror and Forte claims she's running away. On the plus side, this leads to a Tim Curry villain song. Love takes the wildest heart and makes it tame. If you're turned on, then just turn off! On the downside, said song mostly involves tormenting the beast with evil Linuses. End result, the beast flies into a rage and smashes all the holiday decorations. Meanwhile, Lumiere and Cogsworth are tailing Belle for matchmaking purposes. Oh! Hello! Oh, dear! Oh! Allez, allez! Oh! Faster, faster! I think we finally found a use for you! Clock boarding! No, snow clocking! Fife has been sent by Forte to make sure Belle meets with an accident, even though he'd clearly rather be on the side of niceness by this point. Still, he startles Philippe, again, mostly by accident, causing Belle to nearly get drowned by her surprisingly heavy Christmas tree. The Beast rescues Belle, but he's pretty pissed about it because he thinks she was trying to leave him, and probably because this is the second time in like a month he's had to go out into the cold to save her. So he tosses her half hypothermia ass into the dungeon. You said you'd never leave. I wasn't trying to leave. I just wanted to make you happy. Once again, this is the fundamental problem with this movie. Instead of fleshing out the original narrative, it makes it make even less sense. Belle already had to deal with a lot of crap from the Beast, and it feels like this should be the last straw for her rather than something she meekly accepts. The enchanted objects arrive to comfort Belle, though Angelique does a pretty crummy job at it. I told you the master would not allow this. I told you Christmas was a hopeless folly. But, I was wrong. How did that happen? Angelique has had maybe five minutes of screen time tops, and she's been a miserable pill the entire time. There's been nothing to prompt this character development, which mostly exists to give Bernadette Peters a reason to sing. And sure, having Bernadette Peters sing is always a good thing, but narratively speaking, this does require a bit more setup. So, while Belle and company are going all who's down in Whoville, Forte is stoking the beast's despair and trying to convince him to destroy the magic rose and accept his monstrous fate. Unfortunately for him, Belle's present is conveniently located on the same table. Oh, a storybook. Does this one have pretty pictures you can color? <laughs> Tim Curry's sass is the only thing keeping me alive at this point. Belle's story, in true Manic Pixie Dream Girl fashion, is all about a magic castle where the master is a mean old grump, but only on the outside, and he just needs a little kindness. Touched by the present, the beast goes to the dungeon where... Each his own, my friend. You know how to get me stressed. But when it comes to making Christmas special... Uh, I'm a cut above the rest. Sin number nine, a cut above the rest, is in progress. This is a really bad time for a silly argument song between two supporting characters. Also, it just demonstrates how a comic pairing that can and has worked in the past can become annoying through the power of bad writing. Beast comes in all apologetic, and Belle forgives him, allowing the cycle of abuse to continue. Of course, Forte's not quite ready to give up yet, and he plays so loudly that he activates the fault line under the castle. What do you think you're doing? Don't you see, Fife? They can't fall in love if they're dead! Wait, how does killing everyone play into Forte's objective? If the beast dies, he's stuck gathering dust in a tower with no influence and no audience. Now, if he'd said they can't fall in love if she's dead, that would have fit better with his primary goals. And, okay, playing Angel's Advocate, you can argue that this is a crazy if-I-can't-have-you-nobody-can thing, but it's a pretty sharp shift in a movie that's too short and not well-written enough to sustain it. 
Also, I really don't want to think about the possibility of Beast Forte shipping being a thing. The Beast stops Forte by... Whoa, straight up ripping his guts out! Damn. I'll say this, it's not often Disney heroes take that direct a role in the bad guy's demise. No matter, happy Christmas celebrations all around! And what a wonderful Christmas it was. I suppose, if anyone saved Christmas, it was Belle. Merry Christmas. I don't know, I think Beast gets an assist for murdering the evil organ. Oh, and Fife is now the official court composer because he also kind of helped, briefly. And Belle gets a rose for Christmas because symbolism. Sweet Lucifer, I hate this movie. Not even the magnificently hammy Tim Curry can save it. Everything about it, the animation, the music, the writing, and especially the relationship development between the title characters, is a depressing mockery of the reasons why the original film is a beloved classic. In fact, I can think of only one other musical that shits on its predecessor so thoroughly. So congratulations, Beauty and the Beast, The Enchanted Christmas. You get to join Love Never Dies in the inaugural class of musical sequel hell, the place for subjects so wretched even I don't want to deal with them. So let it be recorded. This session of the Infernal Court in musical hell is now adjourned. <laughs>